Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I'm Evelyn Marcus, and in addition to being a psychologist, I am featured in the documentary about anti-Semitism, Never Again Is Now. I am a Dutch Jew and a daughter of Holocaust survivors. In 2006, I immigrated from the Netherlands to the United States because of the rising anti-Semitism in Europe. I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller. I'm the founder of the nonfiction theater project, thenedgethewedge.com, which is also professionally translated into German. I grew up in a Midwest town in which there were very few Jews. Our parents and grandparents came at the turn of the previous century to escape the Tsar and other programs. So we did not know very much about the Holocaust yet. In 1970, only 25 years after the end of World War II, my U.S. Army officer, husband, and I were stationed in Munich, and this changed our lives forever. Born in New York and resident in Munich, Terry Schwartzberg is a leader in the commemoration of the victims of the Holocaust and the head of the Munich chapter of the Stolpersteine. Terry is also chair of Zikaron Holocaust Commemoration, the 501c3 set up to enable Americans to support his commemoration work. Welcome, Terry, to our show. We're thrilled to have you on. I'm thrilled to be here, and I want to say never again. I love that because that is what has turned out to be my life's work, making sure that never again a Jew experiences fear, is left alone, feels like a victim, and never again that the Holocaust will ever or anything like it will ever happen. That is my life's work. Right, and that's what we're going to discuss uh, further in um, in this show of today. Um, can you share with us, please, a brief background explanation of your journey from the U.S. to now living in Munich? Uh, what motivated you to make this change? It was all, I would say, serendipity. I arrived in Berlin in 1980, West Berlin, in the Cold War days as a young investigative journalist. I latched on to the International Herald Tribune, which was the subsidiary of the New York Times and Washington Post for many years, a well-known newspaper. I wrote for them for 25 years. I was born in New York and grew up in New York, India, a little village in India. My father was an anthropologist and I was student council president of Oshkosh High, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I attended Brandeis, which was founded by my family, among others, and finished up at the University of Wisconsin after some years in Asia, running around, getting into all sorts of trouble, being a young journalist. Um, I arrived in Berlin and fell in love with the city. It was a very fascinating, it is a very fascinating place. And a few years later, hardship, lack of work with the Herald Tribune forced me to come to Munich, where I've been since 1985. And I worked for the Tribune, as I said, for many years. And then I had my own PR consultancy. We did a lot of business information. But for the last 10 years, I've been what I call an ethical campaigner, tikkun olam. I try to heal the world. We try to heal the world. Our two subjects are main topics, commemoration of the victims of the Holocaust and climate for the UN and other organizations. Okay. Thank you. Now let's get to the Stolfersteiner. Let's get to the Jewish part, the commemoration of victims. And will you explain for our audience what it is? And okay, give us the story. I mean, we know it, but give the rest of us. There are 100,000 of these Stolperstein, they mean stumbling blocks, in 1,800 cities in 28 countries. It's the largest project of commemoration the world has ever seen. It is the world's project of Holocaust commemoration. Um, each Stolperstein is for a victim of the Nazis, Jew, gay, um, it's Jehovah's Witness, anybody that the Nazis killed or persecuted gets a Stolperstein. The interesting thing is, they get these Stolperstein are placed. This one is going to be placed in December in Munich. They are placed in in front of the buildings in which the people lived, the homes the people lived. In other words, if you lived in that house before the Nazis came and took you off to Auschwitz, that's where you get your Stolperstein. And um, Stolperstein are not supported by the government. It's a purely private thing, individual things. People donate the money. People place the Stolperstein. Many of these people, of course, are the grandchildren, great-grandchildren of Holocaust victims. Other, very often, are the people who are now living in the building. They want to say, we have not forgotten these people. We want to commemorate these people every single day. And that is the interesting thing about the Stolperstein. You go to Dachau, you go to Auschwitz, very moving, incredibly moving. But when you go there, you know what's going to happen. The Stolperstein, that's the stumbling idea. You stumble across them 
with your eyes and with your heart and with your mind. And I'm happy to say not with your feet. We've never had a lawsuit of anybody stumbling over Stolperstein. And we have a lot of lawyers in Germany too, by the way. So if you want to, if you've had, if you have Holocaust victims in your family, you can check and see if the Stolperstein have already been placed with him. If not, contact me and we'll help you place them. I would like a little clarification. First of all, before I saw them in Germany, I did think that I was going to stumble on them, but they're placed so that they're basically really flat in the cobblestones. Right. They don't, you don't, they're not above the, they're placed in the in the in the sidewalk right in front of the house. So you building, you do not stumble, but they're, and they're not, they're ubiquitous, but they're not, you know, very obtrusive. You really, you'll catch them if you look, you'll go, oh my God, I was just in Budapest. And in Vienna, and I kept on stumbling across them going, wow, there's Dobberstein, and I stopped and read them, yep. Okay, number two, if a person actually had the fortune to survive, they can, there can still be a Stolperstein in front of that person's house, is that correct? That's entirely correct, and it's a very interesting point, because our goal is to tell family stories. Okay. You know, five members of a Holocaust, five members of a family, say the family Cohn in Munich were killed, the six had the fortune to survive, we will place Stolperstein for any surviving member too. Okay, so I think that's very important. Second of all, I noticed that the language changed. I'd like you to translate one for an example in a moment, in a moment. But I noticed that early ones from some research I did said uh, died in Auschwitz, for example. And then it was changed to German to say murdered in Auschwitz, which I like much better. So I'm interested to, to know when you translate this one directly. So tell us, you know, line by line what it says. It says, this is where Federer and Kissinger lived. He lived in downtown Munich, the area, by the way, that which the Nazis took over to expand the headquarters of Adolf Hitler. Right there. I mean, they just disenfranchised Jewish families. They threw them out of the apartments and then they killed him. He was deported in 1941 on November 20th, 1941 to Kaunas in Lithuania with 997 other Munich Jews. And he was murdered there on the 25th of November in Fort Number no. 9, along with 22,000 other Munich Jews. They had to shovel their own graves, and they were killed in a 36-hour period, 23,000 Jews all told. And that's what it says. And you're right. It's Now it says immortal, which is murdered. And that's exactly what happened. They weren't killed. They were murdered. But what, why does Dachau also appear on that particular stumbling stone? Because that's a very interesting thing. Because in 1938, a lot of Munich Jews, to intimidate them, were sent to Dachau. Most were released. They wanted to scare them into leaving or scare them into giving up all their money and everything else like that. Some, unfortunately, never managed to get out of the country. A lot, you know, half of Munich Jews survived, which is very good. Actually, two thirds of Munich Jews survived. Half of German Jews survived because they were exposed to the Nazis starting in 1933. It was the people like in Poland and Romania who had no idea what was coming out of where this 95 to 99 percent of all Jews in a shtetl in Poland were just murdered, you know. For instance, my family, my family in Slutsk, which is now Belarus in those days, it was the Soviet Union. My great grandmother Shimka, lovely lady, got, she had 14 children, long story with her husband. 11 of them went to the United States, three of them went to Moscow and Petersburg. None of them died in the Holocaust because of Shimka, who died in 1945. But in my shtetl of Slutsk, 5,000 Jews were killed on October 27, 1941, by the Lithuanians and by the uh, SS. And among those 5,000 were 69 family members of mine. Family members I had never had a chance to get to know, so it's a bit hard to mourn for them. Family members for whom I plan to stay, place Stolperstein should Lukashenko, the head of Belarus, ever allow, and there's a war in Ukraine going on, but my goal is to place the 69 Stolperstein for these people. Uh, I hope that will that you'll succeed with that. That's, uh, yeah. You know, if you're Jewish, the only way to survive is, and you know this, Phyllis, and you know this, Evelyn, the only way we Jews we, we have is with chutzpah. We're not, you know, chutzpah is what keeps us going. You know, you just say, we're going to do it. We don't know how. It'll be difficult. But at the end, somehow, we've realized all our goals. Is this not true? Yes. Evelyn, do you want to ask the next question? Sure. Um, Terry, you are having a... a a project called the Kippa Experiment, um, which you launched on December 1st, 2012. Um, and um, that has that got the Civil Courage Award uh, and is part of an exhibition in the Jewish and other in Jewish and other museums. Um, can you tell us about that experiment and 
with, could, could you tell us more about that experiment? And I have some more questions about it. Well, first of all, I brought down a few. I have a huge collection. As you said, 13 of them are in the Museum of German History, the official museum of the German government in Bonn, in the Jewish Museum in Munich, in the Jewish. I'm losing some of my collection, but I brought them a Green Bay Packers fan. I am from Wisconsin. I would like to wear this. As you know, I love this one. Um, because you guys are in LA, my cousin Gary gave me this. I'm a Yankees fan, but for you, I brought my Dodgers keeper. The Dodgers are I'm doing amazingly well at the moment. I love the Dodgers, I love the Yankees more, but I the Dodgers, this is from Yaya Manuel. I love his things. He never gives me any for free. Maybe he should because I do it from Jerusalem. I've got lots of keypot. And at the moment, I don't even know what I'm wearing. Oh, yes, I'm wearing this colorful one. So it was, I'm a reformed Jew. And I love going to my congregation of Bet Shalom. I go regularly, of course, for the high holidays. I celebrate Shabbat every Friday evening. But the idea, the concept of my wearing a kippah every day, wherever life took me in Germany, in Europe, had you told me 12, 15, 20 years ago, I would end up doing that. I would have never have believed it because why, you know? But what something I think that we have discussed, Evelyn, and very interested in hearing your experiences and Phyllis is, People kept on telling me that anti-Semitism was rampant in Germany. And the only way to avoid it was not to show the world that you're Jewish. In other words, the moment I would put on a kippah or you know, wear a Star of David or read a newspaper in Hebrew, people would start spitting me, would start insulting me. I was risking it. And I said to myself, I had lived in Germany for over 30 years. I said, I'm not going to stay in a country where I am not welcome. In other words, I'm not going to, if anti-Semitism is rampant in Germany, I have to leave, although I have a house, you know, I have children, grandchildren, but I'm not gonna stay. I'm here of my own free will and volition. And I said, okay, how can I test it? And then this wild day came, idea came to me, put a keep on your head and go out and see what happens, just for my own self. And uh, that was December 1st, 2012. As you said, I went out nine o'clock in the morning, my nice neighbor in Munich went out to shop for vegetables. I'm a vegetarian, went to buy coffee. And, you know, very nervous. I was like, is anybody watching me? What's going to happen? Where are the anti-Semites? But also trying at the same time to be cool, you know, radiate. I'm just wearing a keeper. This is perfectly normal. Nothing's going to happen. So, and what has happened since it's been, you know, almost 4,000 days since then. I've been in 150 cities and 17 countries, I think, if you count Israel and the United States. where, And, you know, I have had not a single bad experience, which is lovely. And I've had a lot of very amusing experiences. If you've got time on your podcast, I could tell you about 13 or 15 stories. You can decide if you have the time. Maybe I'll tell one story. Is it okay if I tell one story? Oh, one brief story. Okay, one, one short story. I was in Augsburg, a city near Munich. It was a December day. I had just started out. I was with my daughter. We were rushing to get a train in a very ugly neighborhood. It was dark. And a very a big man came out of a bar. You know, he had a Hadn't shaved for a while. He was wearing a bomber jacket. He had a lot of very curly hair. Of course, I'm bald. He was obviously of North African origin. And he came out and asked me, German, of course. He says, are you from Jerusalem? I said, no, I'm from New York. But actually, I am Jewish. What about you? He said, well, I'm from Algiers and I'm Muslim. Then I waited to see what would happen. You know, my daughter's there too. And I'm going, uh oh, it's just a moment where I get, you know, I get in the newspapers for being, you know, hit, beat up on something. And the man said, I just wanted to tell you, I think it's great that you're showing your Jewish identity. We Muslims should do that too. We should be proud of ourselves and not be afraid. And then he gave me a bear hug and he took his bristly face and rubbed it against my cheeks. Gave me a kiss. My daughter shrieked in laughter. She couldn't imagine that her father would, you know, get a kiss from another man. And he went back into his bar to continue to drink and smoke and do all the things he was doing and carousing and so on. I went on to the station, to the train. These things happen every once in a while. But most of the time, nobody cares. I was just in Budapest. I was just in Vienna. I'm in Munich every day. People will look every once in a while. But, you know, they're, they're nice looking kipoto, I would say, you know. But nobody, and they, you know, they're interested, but nobody's going like, or something like that. Nobody's ever said anything negative or anything else. Most people don't care, I think, anymore. Most people are so self-involved nowadays. They just simply, you know, they want to get on with their lives. They want to get back to the social media or whatever. But I've never had a bad experience. That's so, great to hear. That's great to hear, Terry. That's great yeah. to hear. So um, um, with you never had a bad experience. So because I, I, I was wondering... I mean, I I know that the 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 
the the German government is uh, supporting projects um, where um, a positive Jewish life is shown in Germany. Um, uh, they believe that uh, that will help um, uh, decrease anti-Semitism in Germany. Because we know you, you have no anti-Semitic experiences in Germany, but we know from the newspapers and from the statistics of the official organizations that um, there is substantial anti-Semitism in Germany um, and also physical attacks on Jews. So the, one of the German government's strategies is to support the showing of, you know, of openly Jewish life in a positive way. And that the German that the Jews have are um, have been for centuries uh, part of the of the German culture and history. Um, I was wondering, and I think that that can ha certainly have an effect on certain prejudices and the feeling that the other that the Jew is the other, etc. That you can decrease that. Uh, somewhat in that way, but we also know that there are anti-Jewish um, behaviors coming from more from ideology than from prejudice. Uh, for instance, from religion. For instance, from um, um, uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, solidarity with uh, the Palestinian people, and therefore hating Israel, and in some cases, therefore hating Jews. Um, do you think your your kippa project, which I am, from what I understand, means that you are wearing a kippa, right? That's, that's all I'm doing is wearing one of my many. Keep that's the project. So, so do you think people who are coming more from a ideological hate against Jews in Israel that that it will have an impact there? First of all, you mentioned a lot of things that are of great importance. First of all, the last thing I would deny is that there's anti-Semitism in Germany. Between 10 and 20 percent of Germans are anti-Semitic, which is about the same percentage in the United States. We have not had anybody seriously injured in Germany for as long as we can remember. The last one where anybody was injured at all was 2012, that they required a hospital. I don't treatment. agree. I don't agree. There was a, 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 a man in a park last year or at the beginning of the year even this year, who was attacked by uh, five. I, I know the young story. Man, I, I where he was wearing a kippa and he was. Yeah, he, and that was not. I, would say, I happened to be actually on the spot when it happened. I happened to be shortly away. Oh, the wow. story is, yeah, and the story is completely different. It was not, he, he got involved, he was not Jewish. He got involved in, he spoke Arabic. He thought they were insulting him as a group of Syrians. He said they weren't. He got involved. He got, and they started, and he said, they said, stay out of this, doesn't bother you. And he had just put on a keeper to try it. And then he got, it was from Prenzlau bag and he got whipped, but they were just basically, he got involved. That's the problem. That's, not the, that's not the incident I mean. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, that's not the incident I mean. <laughs> Evelyn, I can't get involved in incidents. Let me just, please, let's yeah. give the overview. Right. The overview is, I think there's several points to be made. First of all, what you spoke, I think the German government is wonderful. And um, the first thing, if you asked any Jew in Germany, the first thing we always want to establish, we want to maintain, we want you in America to know is there's a tremendous flourishing of Jewish life and Jewish culture in Germany, even without the government. The government is helping us, but we have now 300,000 people. If we could count all the Israelis that are hanging around Berlin, we might know exactly, but the Israelis love coming to Berlin. They stay, you know, they stay, but they're, so there's about 300,000 Jews. There's 138 congregations in Germany. That's a lot. And of which 30 are reformed. And um, you, as you said, Evelyn, this is quite true. Before Corona, hopefully after Corona, any evening in Germany, you can go to a festival of Jewish literature, of Jewish music, of Jewish dance, of Jewish food. I love to cook myself. I love to have, you know, shakos where we all make our own version of shakshuka and, shak and see who cooks the best shakshuka. My shakshuka, by the way, is the best in the world. I will just maintain that there may be a lot of competition. Okay. So Jewish life is flourishing. Now, 
and anti-Semitism that 10 to 14 to 20 percent of the people. Nobody has been killed in contrast to Pittsburgh and San Diego. I recently had a discussion when I was in the United States. I was in an airplane flying from uh, Reno, Nevada to uh, Los Angeles, where you live. A man came to sit next to me and said, by the way, I'm Jewish and I'm gay, and I can't tell anybody any of my clients, I don't dare to tell any of my clients that I'm either Jewish or gay because I'm afraid they would not want to you know, work with me any longer. I simply could not believe that in the United States in 2021 or 2022, that is the case. It may be, I don't know. You know your country much better than I know. Um, most Jews get by by being invisible. They're afraid to show their Jewish identity. They feel in the moment they show their Jewish identity, they're putting themselves and their children and their houses at risk. This is the truth. Um, the figures on anti-Semitism are, are scary, but they're misleading. They expand the definition of anti-Semitism to encompass anything that is appears online, like in Twitter or like in Facebook or whatever, and anything to do with the Stolperstein, which we'll get to. In other words, the Stolperstein are not a Jewish thing. They're about Jewish commemoration. But by that definition, there is more anti-Semitism in Germany. So as I said, there exists. That's one side of the coin. It's horrible, and my feeling, and that's why I was, I started out just doing it for myself. You understand? This was just for myself so I could say, I can stay in Germany. I have become something of a national figure because of that. I do not lay claim to making the final statement about anti-Semitism in Germany. It's just my own experience. It's just my own experience. I don't know. It has inspired a lot of people to, we found an organization so that Jews and non-Jews could get together. That Jews, if they're hidden, they should stop being hidden. My basic goal is, with this Kipa thing, it turns out, I didn't know it at the time, my goal is to take back the streets, to make sure that we are in streets. And I'm gonna make it emotional here, okay? And if I do, I wanna excuse myself. I am a Jew in Germany, and Evelyn and Phyllis, I am not afraid. I refuse to live in fear. And I refuse to have anybody else live in fear either. And if that means wearing a kippah and going out in the streets, that's what I do. If that means commemorating the victims of the Holocaust virtually every day in autumn, workshops, whatever, I will do it. I did not come to Germany 45 years after the Holocaust, or 35 in my case, to live in fear. I picked this country, and the only reason I stay in this country besides which I have a nice house in Munich, a nice life, is because I feel safe as a Jew, and I want to preserve this. And I want every single German to know about the Holocaust and to be ashamed of that and to be conscious of that. And that is one of my goals too. But never again is what you said, never again, any Jew that I hear about that has experienced anti-Semitism and they're friends of mine, I say to them, I will walk with you. I will go with you. You should not live in fear. And I think it's very positive in Germany. Anytime anybody's attacked, whether it actually happened or happens the way it's illustrated in the press, it's a huge amount of vigilance in Germany about anti-Semitism, and that's great. It's scary, it scares Jews, but it's also great because it keeps them feeling like if anything happens to them, the whole weight of public opinion will be on their side. I, 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 I think it's very moving what you said, and I really do understand how you can feel safe in Germany. I mean, I lived in Germany and we were, faced uh, harassment for being Americans at the time in 70 to 72. I mean, you know, they could tell it without Mitch opening, you know, short haircut, et cetera, military. You know, we were the occupiers, which we were. But but I wanted you to share with us in connection with this, that when there is an anti-Semitism problem uh, about that organization that you described to me and why you're going to Nordhausen, which I think is such a positive example of how taking anti-Semitism seriously in Germany. Could, so you could describe that. Yeah, Nordhausen is a town of 120,000 Eastern Germany, which used to be communist, and it's been for the last last 42 years, it's been you know, part of West Germany or part of the German thing. So, and they have a problem, not just with anti-Semitism, they have a problem with neo-Nazis. And neo-Nazis were very, basically ruling the town for a long time, people were living in fear. And the neo-Nazis, there aren't any, there aren't any Jews or very few Jews left in Nordhausen. The neo-Nazis love to prey upon Africans, and, you know, gays and Vietnamese and everybody else like that. And they, German government has formed something called Demokrati Leben, democracy is alive. And they have outlets, they have little everywhere in Germany, in every city in Germany. We wrote to them, wrote to others, and they said, we can help you. Do you want to be helped? And they said, yes, we want to be helped. 
And how can you do it? And we said, we're going to do a faces where the names in which we show, we project the photos of the Jews who were victims of the Holocaust, also figures from long history and members of the resistance. There was a resistance in Nordhausen, also of the gypsies, the Sinti and Roma. We will project them onto the buildings where they live. So starting on October 11th, we will be taking our projectors. We'll be going with a huge coalition of, from churches, from the local Jewish congregation, a lot of school children. We'll be going around Nordhausen, projecting on the buildings the photos of the people will be reading their biographies. We will be taking, as I said, never again, your model, my model, never again, we will be taking and showing that the streets belong to us. And very movingly, our last evening will be spent in Mittelbau Dora, which was a concentration camp where 20,000 people were worked to death building the B2 rocket and other military things underground under horrible conditions. This will be our first our first faces with the names in a concentration camp. I'm already tearing up at the thought of doing that. I speak often at concentration camps. I speak Kaddish, play Kaddish with the victims, do that quite often. And it's always very emotional for me. I don't think I've ever gotten through Kaddish without crying because you realize that these people never got to hear Kaddish before they were murdered. So I think that that's a really, I would say exciting example of, I mean, on your part, but it also on the German city's willingness to allow this and in, in, in to, in to say publicly, we did this. And now we're recognizing what we did. This is why I think the German civil society has managed to withstand these waves of right wing extremism, which are gripping every country, including my beloved home country of the United States of America with Trumpism and everything else like that, France, whatever, Germany, the center has held. And I think it's our culture of remembrance based on the Stolperstein, based on my project, Faces for the Names, based on all these projects, because people have learned what fascism, what extremism, what racism leads to. It leads to genocide. It leads to persecution and genocide. And that's why the, you know, these people are very aware they have to nip everything in the bud. And we will be glad to report to you, Phyllis and Evelyn, and to your people about what our experiences are in Nordhausen, you know, because that is a whole different, you know, this is the first time we're going to be in the East. We'll see what has happened. But I think it's wonderful. We invite you all on September 21st, we're having a first workshop in Nordhausen with several schools where they school children, the school kids from the ages of 11 on to 18 can develop their own ideas how they want to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust and members of the resistance. We do that in Munich and we're always amazed how young people, they come forth with raps, they come forth with poetry, ideas for, you know, mobile sort of things. And they're amazingly productive and always identify immediately with victims of the Holocaust. I think that's wonderful that Germany's young people are aware of the Holocaust and see their own plights and their own situation in terms of the Holocaust, they are inspired by that. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I think there is there is no more uh, consciousness of uh, the country's role in the Holocaust uh, than in Germany, much more than in uh, anywhere else in Europe. Um, the, the the German education has and and cultural projects have so much done so much work to to remind the population of the history of Germany and, and, and the atrocities uh, of Germany during World War II. And I think uh, Germans of all people in the world are most conscious of what happened, what their country did, not this generation, but their, you know, the, the ones before them did uh, in terms of genocide and, and war. Um, around the world and um and it's they have done so to speak uh, a lot of homework on that much more than other countries that had a role as well maybe a smaller role but still a substantial role in killing jews and other minorities um or allowing it or looking away from it or you know helping doing it um as you said your your family was was killed also by lithuanians well how much holocaust remembrance is going on in lithuania not much not true there's not they're they're finally getting there that's interesting but for many years fort number nine where these twenty three thousand jews were killed was nothing was there it was just a wreck you know it was a ruin 
And then the EU came along and the fact that Jews were coming to see where their grandparents, parents, grandparents, great grandparents had been killed, the Lithuanians got the idea, okay, well, maybe we should do it, you know, a little bit of Holocaust tourism, tourism if I can be cynical. And um, it's very interesting what you said because you're from the Netherlands and the Netherlands have, uh, in terms of Stolperstein, although they only have 16 million people, 100,000 Jewish victims, they're the second largest in terms of cities, in terms of number of Stolperstein in Europe. The, the Dutch are very active in Holocaust commemoration, as are the Italians. They're not. Well, I can tell. I can tell you they're not. Okay. Well, Evelyn, this is a subject that you know a lot more than I do. But all I can say is, based on the number of Stolperstein of cities, civilization, you know a lot more than I do. It's what we see. Okay. You know. You live there. You know what's happening. Um, in Hungary too, but like countries like Poland with over three million Jewish victims, you know, they, they hate the idea of, you know, being reminded that it also played a huge role in the persecution of the Jews. And they fought tooth and nail against the Stolperstein. There are only maybe 50 Stolperstein at latest count in all of Poland, where there should be about 4 million. France is pretty much the same story. Now France is coming. So it's based, it's a litmus test. How willing is a country to commemorate the victims of one way of the victims of the Holocaust? For instance, so Terry, I, I have a question. It's 50 years ago that uh, um, the Israeli um, uh, athletes at the, murdered, the, the, murdered the, in the Olympic, were yeah. killed in a terrorism attack and Germany, exactly 50 years and, ago. It, and, and, and the, and the, and the the uh, Olympic Games went on after that. They weren't stopped or anything like that. I would have stopped. Them. What, 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 what do you notice of commemoration uh, in Germany of that event? Well, I mean, living just, in, you're living in Munich, right? Yeah, they had the events yesterday. They actually commemorated them yesterday, and um, very movingly. Okay, they there is now uh, an area where it happened, there's a memorial where it's happened, very controversial, it took a long time to get straightened out. I think if you ask me, Evelyn and Phyllis, they should have had it, you know, right then, 1972, they should have stopped the Olympic Games. How can you go on with the Olympic Games when nine athletes have been killed? Wait, Phyllis, you want to yes, I just want to, in all fairness, because I, did, I just wrote a blog post for Times of, Times of Israel about this. I did a lot more extensive research. And eventually they did stop the Games, but only for 12 hours and only under extreme pressure and then went back. Just to be fair. Okay, keep going. Okay, right. I would have stopped them entirely. Um, yes. There was a horrible squabble about indemnification for the family that was settled 20. They finally got 28 million. It took 50 years for them to get 28 million. There had been some identification collection. Maybe you know more about it than I do, Phyllis. There had been some basic identification. Um, they should have been more. It should have happened right away. Um, but that's not the subject of this evening, but speaking as a Jew in Germany and, you know, with a lot of friends in Israel and everything else like that. So um, I'm very much, you know, kibitzing this thing. It's not my necessarily I was not involved in it, but I've been following it. Yes. Okay. And I have a Times of Israel blog post that I wrote about it because my husband and I were supposed to be at the Olympics. We had tickets. Um, because we were living in Munich, but then the army changed the category of officers and which is a uh, um, particular subset and, and cut back their time serving. So we left Germany in May of 72. But I write about in the uh, blog post that I remember the moment I heard it on the news exactly is indelibly imprinted in my mind is the moment I heard about the Twin Towers. I will never forget that moment. So I'm glad that Evelyn brought this up because I think we should say in memory of these, uh, they weren't all athletes. Some of them were coaches and one of them was the official representative yeah, of the 11 you. Israelis. And, and I will just say this one thing and then I'm gonna ask for last thoughts because it's getting late. That one of them, Shaul Land Ladani, okay, I probably mispronounced his name. He had survived Bergen-Belsen, Rand Frank died. And at first they thought that he had been killed he was, but he was not one of the hostages. And the headline in, in Israel apparently said something like, I have it in my blog post, but it's not here. Landy doesn't survive Germany a second time, which was heartbreaking. He actually did survive. But still, that was my feeling that here, only a few, well, by this time, it's 27 years after the end of World War II, Jews are being killed in Germany again. So I'm glad that we're remembering well, that today. What Evelyn and I would have both agree upon is, for instance, what moves me greatly is the murder of Shlomo Levine. Shlomo Levine in 1979, 
because this is a huge thing. He was in Erlangen, which is in central Bavaria. He had been, um, he'd been from, he was from Erlangen, went to Israel, became ministry for heavy industry, and then out of the goodness of his heart, came back to his native central Bavaria and tried to build up Jewish life there. And he was attacking, he was, there was anti-Semitism, institutional anti-Semitism in the 70s in Bavaria, and he met it face on. And he was murdered along with his non-Jewish um, spouse equivalent in December, December 19th, I believe in 1979, by a right-wing group called Versport Group, allegedly. I better not say anything else because I'll have a lawsuit on my hands or anything. Supposedly by one person who may or may not have been associated with Versport Group. You can get a lawsuit immediately upon this. So, and I don't know, anyway, allegedly, I say allegedly. In any case, he was murdered. And then the Bavarian police started, you know, instead of, you know, doing their investigation in neo-Nazi circles. It was obvious that it was the neo-Nazis he had been, they had said they were going to kill. They asked people in their own congregation, are you corrupt? Was he involved in, in things like that? They tried to shift the blame from the neo-Nazis where it was clear that they was to be law, sought to, you know, do something else. So, I mean, you know, there've been all these very disturbing things. There have been disturbing things in post-war Germany. It took a long time for Germany especially in the justice, the system of justice or injustice to get, you know, to get rid of its horrible Nazi legacy. And Bavaria's minister of justice, we're going to be together next week. There's a huge reception about this. It's the first to say it's a process that has not been completed. Repeat that before you do last words, because our time is up. A process that has not been completed. Right. This Germany system of justice, the process of dealing with the Nazi past it's a process that has not been completed. It still has to be completed. I think unless there's something that you really want to add, that that's a really effective way to end. I, as being Jewish, I would have one more thing to say. Okay. okay. Um, we live, we're a nonprofit, we're volunteers. We um, need donations. We need people to help us. Anybody wants to be part of our network in the United States, we, th we love to go on speaking tours. We are, I'm going on a speaking tour. It's been Corona. I'll be in the United States. I've got several dates already. Anybody who wants to have us hear about the Stolperstein, about anti-Semitism in Germany, about Jewish life in Europe, whatever, or just wants to hear my 100 favorite stories about my kippah. And with that, the only thing that really ever interests Germans, and this is my last word, is, you know, Germans are interested in my kippah, but the only thing they ever ask me, and they never ask me, Terry, you know, why are you doing or what are your experience? The only thing they ask me, and they mean this very seriously, they ask me, how does it stay on your head? You know, <laughs> I don't have a clip. This Germans are very technically minded, and why my kippah stays on my head? And I, they say, is it glue? Of course, it's not glue. And, you know, and everything. And I have two answers, and this is my, these are really my last words. The first thing I tell them is, Gravity also applies to Jews, not just to non-Jews. I mean, the gravity will keep that keep on my head. And the second thing I said, it's the faith that keeps my keep on my head. And that is my last word. That's really beautiful ending. We thank you so much. We thank our listeners. And particularly for people who would like to know more about anti-Semitism in Holland and Europe, please, if you haven't, see Evelyn's documentary, Never Again Is Now. You can see it on Amazon or on YouTube. Uh, coupled with this interview today, it will give you a, a, another uh, look at anti-Semitism in Europe and Evelyn speaking up, which is what this program is about. You can find more information about my free project, thinedgeofthewedge.com, and also you'll see the link to the German version there. And everyone, wherever you can, without putting yourself in physical harm, speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.